Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That line is just the common greeting this time of year, right? But let's be honest. For some people, Christmas is not merry. And maybe you're one of them. Yes, I know there are some people who have been in the Christmas mood since Halloween ended. They've been listening to Christmas music for months. They got all their shopping done early. They truly see this as the most wonderful time of the year. And if that's you, then that's great. I am glad you're feeling that way. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you're just in a funk. If you are, then please listen. It's okay to feel what you're feeling. It's okay if you're sad, worried, depressed, lonely, stressed out, scared, whatever. Those feelings don't go away just because the Christmas lights are on and the decorations are on. In fact, sometimes this time of year ramps up those feelings. You know that things don't always go according to plan this time of year. You know that family conflicts are still there. You know there are unmet expectations around Christmas time. Maybe that's why you're feeling this way. Or maybe this is your first Christmas without a certain person in your life. Maybe you've experienced a lot of pain and loss this year. Maybe 2023 was just really hard on you. And you can't wait till 2024. Because you know it can't go anywhere but up. Or maybe you're feeling this way, but you're not exactly sure why. You can't quite put your finger on it. You're trying your best to be all festive, but your heart's just not in it. You feel like you're kind of going through the motions. Something just feels off for you. If I'm describing how you're feeling now, then I want you to know something. I imagine Mary and Joseph felt the same way. Now, I know that might sound strange. Usually at Christmas, we think of Mary and Joseph being super happy about the birth of Jesus. And I imagine they were. But I bet they were feeling a whole lot of other emotions, too. Not all of which were merry and bright. So let's back up a bit. Imagine Mary. She's a teenager. She's going through changes that all teenagers face. Puberty and bullies are making her life a mess. But then one day, when she was just minding her own business, this angel shows up. And the angel tells her that she's going to be pregnant. Not by Joseph and not by her own choice. Mary responds to the line, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Now, I don't think Mary's asking about the process of becoming pregnant. She's old enough to know that. I think what she's really asking is, why me? Mary is scared and reluctant. As if things weren't hard enough for her already. Now her life just got flipped around even more, and she had no say in the matter. Maybe you know what that's like. Maybe something beyond your control has happened to you. Something has completely flipped your life around, and you had no say in the matter. 
And you've asked, why is this happening to me? But you don't get an angel standing in front of you who's going to answer your questions, do you? So you feel scared and overwhelmed and alone. You don't know how to handle this situation. After dropping this bomb on Mary, the angel then tells her that her older relative Elizabeth is pregnant now too. If Mary doesn't believe what God's doing in her life, then she should just check out what's going on in Elizabeth's life. So Mary agrees, and she goes to see Elizabeth. In other words, she probably thinks, if God really can do this in Elizabeth's life, then maybe God can do something in my life too. Sometimes when your life feels out of control, you need someone to be there with you. Someone who's going through the same thing. We need to know that someone is with us in our pain. Elizabeth did that for Mary. She was pregnant too, even though she shouldn't have been. So these two women could help each other. Now, think about Joseph. Somehow, he finds out that Mary's pregnant. We don't know how he found out, but it doesn't matter. The woman he's about to marry is pregnant and not by him. And his immediate response is to divorce her. He doesn't want to deal with all this drama right now. He's trying to make a life for them. But then she goes and spits in his face by getting herself pregnant. Why should he even bother with her? If he's going to disrespect, if she's going to disrespect him like that, then maybe she's not the one he should marry after all. But then an angel shows up and tells Joseph the whole story. The angel talks Joseph off the ledge and gets him to settle down. Joseph then agrees to take Mary as his wife. But their emotional struggles aren't done. Later on, the emperor orders a census. He wants to count the people for the purpose of taxing. So basically, everybody has to stop what they're doing and go to the city of their ancestors. The emperor doesn't care if you're pregnant or preparing for married life or getting ready for a baby. He doesn't care what your plans are. You just have to drop everything and go. Even though we don't have a census like that today, I bet you know what it's like to put your life on. You had these plans for how you wanted things to go, but then something interrupted. Something got in the way. Some unexpected event or tragedy or problem showed up and you had to deal with it. Which meant you had to put your own plans to the side. Inside, though, you were grumbling about it. You were frustrated. You were angry. You saw it as a giant inconvenience. You didn't want to have to deal with all this. And maybe you voiced those complaints to other people. Or maybe you just kept them all inside. But either way, you weren't very happy. That's probably how Mary and Joseph were feeling about this census. And then, as we know, when they finally got to Bethlehem, Mary was about to burst and they couldn't find a place to stay. Eventually, they found a spot, but the place they found was no luxury barn with a rustic feel and nice fresh hay. This was no glamping cabin or Airbnb. 
what they found was basically the first century equivalent of a back alley. So imagine the scene as if it happened today. There's boarded up windows, graffiti on the walls, an overflowing dumpster, pile of cigarette butts. It's dark except for one street light that keeps flickering and a couple of signs from nearby stores. The animals there are not cute and cuddly little lambs and big furry camels, but feral cats and sewer rats. Some of them scurry away when Mary and Joseph enter the alley. The place smells of garbage and sewage. But it's out of the way and it's private. Joseph helps Mary lay down on some garbage bags. And he can't believe that this is where they had the sun. But it is. He crouches down next to her. And she squeezes his hand. And she scrapes. And then, after what seems like just a moment and hours, all at the same time, she gives birth to Jesus. This is not where Mary and Joseph wanted this to happen. If you're about to have a baby, you want to do it well. You want loved ones to be with you. You want to give birth somewhere clean and safe. Mary gave birth to Jesus in a place most people avoided. This was basically the gutter. I can imagine Joseph cut the umbilical cord with a pocket knife and cleaned up Jesus with the sleeve of his coat. Then he found a discarded Amazon box with some bubble wrap and laid Jesus in it. This was his cradle. In the flickering light of that one street lamp with sirens blaring in the distance, this is where Mary and Joseph Look at Jesus for the first time. This is what all of those cutesy nativity scenes capture. They show two exhausted, frustrated, emotionally spent parents looking down on this new mouth to feed. But the thing is, In the midst of their suffering, in the midst of life beyond their control, in the midst of fears and struggles and being in a funk, Jesus still came. That's the promise of Christmas. Jesus comes to you. In the darkest and most unexpected places in your life. There they were. Mary and Joseph. Two young parents feeling completely overwhelmed. Wondering where their lives would go from here. And yet, right there in that cardboard box was the savior of the world. He was Jesus. God with us. God with them. God with you. The one who had created the beautiful universe had come down into their messy lives. The one who figured out how to make human eyes work was now blinking his own eyes at them. The one who knows all of our human flaws was now looking with love on two stressed out people. 
Yes, Mary and Joseph didn't have decorations or lights or cookies or presents under the tree. But you know what? They had Jesus. And more importantly, Jesus had them. Jesus looked at them, and they looked at him. And in that moment, I bet they remembered what the angel told them. They remembered how special this little boy was going to be. And then after they lifted him out of that box and held him close, and they looked at each other, and they looked at him again in those big eyes, they probably felt like the most blessed people in the world. And then, not too far away, an army of angels showed up and announced this birth to some shepherds out in the field. Because his birth was something that had to be proclaimed. The God of all creation has come. And he has come to you. You who feel like your life is out of control. You who are in a funk. You who feel like everything is a mess. Jesus was born for you. God has come into your mess. And has taken on flesh and blood for your sake. God knows your suffering and your pain. And God has come to you anyway. God knows everything you're going through, even if nobody else knows. And God loves you so much that God has come into your world to bring you healing and hope and new life. So no matter how you are feeling this Christmas, Christ is born for you. And as the angel said, that is truly good news of great joy for all people. And so in the name of this one who has come into our mess, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.